So recall the project so far. Uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, they're all trying to explain everything. And all three of them help themselves to some kind of notion of form or universals. Uh, Socrates started the game, Plato expanded on it and said that all universals are, you know, are form and they're separately existing independent things um, that uh, are more real than the particular things. Aristotle didn't quite agree with Plato. He tried to give an account where there is some kind of explanation of everything, right? where Plato appealed to a form and specifically being as a form, uh, Aristotle appealed to uh, substance. And uh, for him, what explained everything is substance. Now, there's still form and there's still matter, but the form isn't independent of substance. It uh, constitutes substance. So those are, uh, so that's roughly what Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are trying to do. Now, there are lots of philosophers out there history. I mean, we're, go we're going hundreds of years uh, past them. Uh, there are lots of philosophers that try to carry on this project and are still trying to provide some kind of reality and some kind of objectivity to... Uh, to universals, to form, to definition, to essence, trying to preserve some way for there to be the truth, regardless of what people think the truth is. And they want it to be out there. So one group of philosophers, uh, the church usually called the rationalists, uh, were also carrying on this project, and they were they, they thought that uh, the universals were innate. They're, you somehow have them from the beginning. So uh, Plato has some notion like this with uh, the soul separately existing before birth and after death that is somehow merged or has, is in contact with the forms, with all these universals. And, and we spend the rest of our life, uh, you know, after we're born, you know, the trauma of birth causes us to forget all these forms. And uh, after, you know, so we spend the rest of our life recollecting uh, form, okay? Remember his, you know, remember uh, Socrates' distinction between inspection and interpretation. You have inspection, and that's what you get from the senses, right? That's, that's what we have from the senses. And then there's interpretation, that's the essence of the definition. He thought you got this through dialectic. And he thought, you know, probably maybe he thought that somehow this was already within you. Right? And Plato thought this was true too. And, you know, so you recollect the universals. He had his four levels of knowledge. He had uh, imagining belief, and this is, corresponds to Socrates' inspection, and that's the empirical. Then you have thinking and perfect intelligence, and that's knowledge of the forms. Right? And you get that through recollection. Aristotle didn't appeal to something quite like that. He has this mysterious phrase called recognition. Right? So you recognize uh, form through, uh, uh, you know, you, you start with, with the knowledge of the empirical. These are his categories. You have the... Uh, you know, you have all these categories, and that's knowledge of the matter. But knowledge of the form was something different. And you recognize form for Aristotle. doesn't go into a whole lot of details what this is like. The rationalists take on this project, and they say that uh, that knowledge of the forms of these universals is innate. Uh, that means within your mind. Right? It's already present there somehow. You, know, you have to dig it up. You may not be immediately conscious of it, but it's already there. So John Locke... Uh, is rejecting any idea of innate ideas. Right? He and uh, several others we're going to look at are called empiricists. Empiricists claim that all knowledge, every last bit of it, uh, is from the senses, is empirical. So where Socrates made a distinction between inspection and interpretation, Locke is going to say it's all inspection, even form. He's going to try and pull this off, say even form or even universals uh, in whatever shape they may be <laughs> uh, are, are from the empirical. And where Plato makes a distinction between uh, imagining and belief on the one hand and thinking and perfect intelligence on the other, uh, Locke's going to say it's all imagining and belief. It all comes from the empirical. There are no innate ideas. So to argue this point, what he tries to do is provide an alternate explanation to innate ideas. Because it is a real question where we have this knowledge of the universal, where this knowledge of the universal comes from. Because it, it's not empirical knowledge right, up to this point. Right? <clears throat> 2 plus 2 equals 4 doesn't contain any empirical content. Right? Um, we did this in class. The universal of tree doesn't look like any particular tree. Universal square 
The definition or essence of square is not any particular square. So Locke has a real challenge here, trying to explain knowledge of these universals without appealing to innate ideas. And his approach is to try to give an account of all these universals, try to give an account of, of all this by starting with and ending with empirical knowledge. And he thinks if he can do this, then uh, there's no need to appeal to these strange forms that are just floating out there, that are somehow part of reality, but are not anything that we can interact with. Uh, and that's his project. That's his project. He's going to try to give an account of truth, of universals, essences, these sorts of things, uh, without appealing to anything non-empirical. And his metaphor for this, his, his starting point for this, is talking about the mind. And for him, the mind is a blank slate, just like this wall. It's blank. It has nothing written on it. And Locke says, through the process of experience, our mind is f filled up, filled up with knowledge. So let's take a look at this step by step. And uh, hopefully, we can fill up our blank slate. So to begin, we're going to start with a little bit of Locke's metaphysics. He doesn't do too much compared to, say, Aristotle and Plato. Um, but he, he does give us a little bit about what exists. And by starting with this, with this notion of what exists, He's going to try and fill in the details of his epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Uh, so, you know, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle didn't make a huge distinction between metaphysics and epistemology. Right? It's kind of wrapped up into one. Um, the rationalists and the empiricists do more to uh, have this distinction between, uh, uh, and it's had, it's do more as far as epistemology is concerned without trying to do too much metaphysics. So for Locke, uh, He's not going to say there's only two things that exist, but he's going to start with two things that do exist. Right? And one is ideas, and the other is qualities. Uh, ideas are simply what we perceive in our mind. Simply what we perceive in our mind. So you're seeing the monitor right now, and you perceive, you have an, you perceive uh, images in your mind. So color, shape. Uh, you perceive the sound of my voice. And when these are taken into your mind through the senses, you are able to you know, perceive these ideas within your mind. So that's ideas. Ideas are what you perceive in your mind. The second thing he deals with are qualities. Qualities are, are in objects. Right? Qualities are in objects. So, uh, your monitor has certain qualities right now that is uh, producing the uh, colors that you see. Right? And the speakers have certain qualities, uh, or your earbuds, one of the two, uh, they have certain qualities that produce the sounds that you hear. Now, the qualities are in the objects. Uh, qualities are not the ideas. There's a distinction between ideas and qualities. Ideas are in your mind, what you perceive in your mind. Qualities are in the objects. Now, as it stands, it's a pretty minimal metaphysics, but that's not a bad thing. Right? He, he's not trying to contest a whole lot about what these things are, uh, but it's real intuitive that we at least that there is this distinction. Right? Even going back to Socrates and Plato, this distinction was there. When we start talking about uh, the difference between particular objects and universals. Right? Universals are in our minds. Particular objects are outside our minds. So, Locke's kind of carrying on this project, but ideas are what are in our minds, and qualities are what are, are, what are in objects. So, the question is, where do ideas come from? Remember, Locke is trying to say we have no ideas that are just simply in us. Now, uh, our ideas are what we perceive in our mind. And there are two sources. There's an external source and an internal source of ideas. All right, now don't freak out yet with the internal source. I'll get to that. 
So the external source of ideas is really common sense. It's what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you touch, what you smell. This is what, th this source of ideas is what Locke calls sensation. Sensation is simply what you get from your five senses, five external senses, what you get from your external sensory organs. External in the sense that they're not in the mind. The eyes are out here, the ears are here, touch is here, it's here, <laughs> touch is here. So sensation is one source of ideas, and that's what comes from the external senses. So looking at uh, this apple here, so we have our uh, white paper that is our mind. And through observing this apple, I have certain ideas from sensation that come from the apple. So it's red. If I were to bite into it, it's sweet, crisp, juicy. The skin is smooth. Uh, apples are mostly liquid, so they're a little dense, a little heavy for their size sometimes, you yeah. know. They're certainly lighter than, say, you know, celery. <laughs> um, I think that's right, lighter than celery. <laughs> so this apple here leaves certain uh, sense, it leaves certain ideas in my mind because of my experiences with the apple. So that's one source of ideas, sensation. That's the external source of ideas. There's an internal source of ideas. This is called what Law calls reflection. Now, my ideas have a certain impact on me. I can perceive myself reacting to the ideas. So, looking at this idea of an apple in my mind, I become hungry. I like apples. Apples uh, whet my appetite. It makes me hungry. I can think about craving. Uh, the apple. So the idea is causing a craving. Right? And that craving is a self an idea. The hunger is an idea. Right? Um, I, could, I could think about how much I like apples. I can reflect on how much I like apples. They're crisp. They're sweet. Right? Especially Fuji apples. Fuji apples are the best. Right? They're crisp. They're sweet. They leave uh, a refreshing taste in my mouth. I enjoy them. Right? These are all reactions, passions is what Locke calls them, to ideas. Okay. So here's this idea of the apple, and it's causing all of this, all of these uh, reactions to me, uh, within me. Right? What Locke calls the passions. Okay. Um, what else? I can reason with apples. You know, I can think about apples. I say apples are sweet, apples are juicy, apples are fruit. And I can perceive that reasoning, right? That perception of the reasoning, the perception of my thinking, the perception of, of how this reacts, how this uh, starts my appetite, and how it, uh, how I'm a, you know drawn to the to apples, and I desire apples. These are all things that are happening in my head, within my head, right? within my mind, I should say, and I can reflect on them, and that reflection is the perception of my reaction, the passions, to that idea. So those are ideas. There are, so those are the two sources of ideas. Uh, sensation, when I actually look at the apple, and reflection, when I perceive what impact those ideas, those sensations, have on me. So we have our source of ideas. Uh, our ideas either come from sensation or reflection. Now what you notice about these ideas is both, both, both these sources, I should say, what you notice about both these sources is that they are from experience. You experience sensations. You experience reflection. Right? You experience reflection. I, you ex I experience the hunger from the apple, the desire for the apple, the uh, uh, attraction to the apple, and, and I experience thinking uh, how apples are fruits, how apples are desirable, this sort of thing. 
So that's the source of ideas, sensation and reflection. And the source for all of that is experience. So from this, Locke is going to try and give an account of knowledge. And this knowledge is going to include even universals. All right. Now the next step is to make a distinction between simple ideas and complex ideas. Now simple ideas are simple. Uh, now by simple, Locke does not mean that they're necessarily easily apprehended, although they are. Right? Uh, simple ideas are the most basic ideas. They are those ideas that compose other ideas. So, uh, you know, this is a sense of simple in the sense we're talking about Legos, right? So each Lego independent is, is simple. But, you, you know, you can't break a Lego apart anymore. Right? It probably destroys the world of physics if you break apart a Lego. So you have that, that simple, most smallest part. That's, that's the Lego. That's simple, the individual one. It's when you put together models or you know, objects or playthings, whatever, with Legos, that you suddenly have a complex object. Well, think of each kind of sensory input as simple. So uh, before I had my red apple, right? That was red. Red is a simple idea. Another simple idea is its taste, right? Sweet. That's another simple idea. Uh, if I've had in the fridge, it's cool. Cool is another simple idea. All right? So I start. So these these individual ideas by themselves are simple, uh, smooth, hard. Pretty much every any way you can start breaking apart the content of your sensations. That's a simple idea. Now that's a starting point of knowledge for Kant are simple ideas. And from these pieces, we're going to get complex ideas. So I started, if I started talking about simple ideas, so now let's look at complex ideas. Now, complex, com complex ideas come from the activity of the mind. Right? Your mind can do many, many things. You can draw attention to a certain object. Right? You can draw attention to a certain part of the object. Now, I said simple ideas are those ideas that can't be broken down anymore. Right? So, thinking about my apple again, I, I can uh, concentrate on the red, right? but I can't break red down anymore. And I can think about the sweetness, but I can't break sweetness down. Right? Um, these ideas are what come together for the idea of apple. Now, that's the first act of the mind. The first act of the mind is bringing ideas together into one object. So I combine the red of the apple, the sweetness, the juiciness, uh, its density, uh, even my own reflections on the apple, how, I, how much I like it, uh, how, um, I, uh, uh, you know, how much I like it, how much I enjoy the taste, how much I hunger for apples, this sort of thing. I put all that together in that apple, all right? So that's the first act of the mind, is bringing these ideas together. And this is the first, com first uh, complex kind of idea. The first complex idea is from this act of bringing the ideas together. And this complex idea is these simple ideas come from that object. So from the first act of the mind, I bring simple ideas together for one object. The second act of the mind, so the, you know, the first idea is combining simple ideas. The second, uh, second act of the mind is comparing two or more ideas, whether they're simple or complex. Right? So I might think about this apple, right? I've been using this apple, and I might even think about another apple. Right? Now you notice with this apple, with the second apple, it's more red. So when I, for the second act of the mind, is comparing two ideas together. In this case, that this apple is, uh, you know, the second apple is more red than the first apple. You know, is more red is a relation. So uh, by comparing these two ideas, 
Right? This is the second act of the mind. Now, I can compare simple ideas, I can compare complex ideas. So, I might uh, think about the idea of fruit. Right? Or, 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 I'm sorry, so I think about, uh, not fruit, but I think about apple and orange. And I put these two ideas together. I have my simple ideas about the orange. It's the color of the orange. Again, it's sweet, but it's tart. Uh, it has a different texture. It's still kind of heavy. The surface of the skin it is still smooth, but it, you know, it has those little pores in it, those little you know, dotted uh, little holes in it. Right? So I have those two ideas. So I can relate the idea of apple. You know, so I take the idea of apple and I compare it to the idea of orange. And I have this kind of relation. Uh, and that relation, for, even from that relation, I can start thinking about how they're similar. Not only how they're different, but how they're similar. I could do the same thing with two apples. I'm going to deal with two apples again. <clears throat> so I can think about how the apples are similar. I could compare my apples to my orange, or oranges, and I can think about how they're similar, and also how they're different. Now this is still an act of the mind. I'm still moving around these ideas on my mind. And by reflection, I uh, perceive this action. So still, even with the first act of the mind by bringing together ideas into, from one object, and the second act of the mind by you know, putting them side by side and comparing them, this is still my perception, my experience of what I'm doing with my mind to these ideas. So with Locke, we're still drawing upon experience. So we have a third act of the mind. First act was bringing together ideas. Second act was setting two ideas apart, you know, two ideas two, next to each other and comparing them. The third act is separating ideas. So when we're thinking about our apples and oranges here. We've got our apples and oranges. Uh, I can, you know, I, I, like I said, I, when I put two apples side by side, I notice there's similarities, and there are some differences. When I put an apple next to an orange, I still note some similarities. Right? I, I know some differences, but there are still some similarities. You know, the seed, the skin, uh, the kind of juice it is, how it grows on their respective trees, so on and so forth. And you know, the tree is another idea, right? I gained that from experience. Seeds are an idea. I gained that from experience. Growth is an idea. I gained that from experience. But I can separate these ideas from the objects, right? So thinking about my fruit here, when I start to think about my apple here, uh, I separate those qualities, no, sorry, those ideas, excuse me, not qualities, those ideas that I recognize as apple. The skin, the flesh, the seeds, the color, you know, the colors, the sweetness, all of it. So I can separate those ideas from the individual apples that I'm looking at, and I can abstract away from them to have an idea of apple. Now again, this idea is derived from experience. My mind is acting upon the idea, separating them out, but through reflection, reflection, that's when I, uh, I perceive my mind acting on it. Okay. So I have my idea of apple, and I create a name for that abstraction. I call it apple, just like I create a name for the abstraction of red. So I have all these so here are a bunch of different reds, right? and by looking at their similarity, I say, I give a name to that similarity and say, that's red. All of a sudden, it looks like we got universals right? through abstraction. We got the same thing when we, even when we're dealing with fruit. So it's a bit more abstract away from, a simple, from the individual simple ideas of red, but we you know, just keep pulling out our simple ideas, red, sweet, smooth, you know. Um, and we could pull out some even more abstractions. So skin, the skin of the apple, you know, the, you know, this apples have skin, apples have this kind of flesh, they have seeds, right? And we spot those same similarities in oranges. Oranges have flesh, oranges have skin, oranges have seed, right? They come from trees. The seeds are on the inside. Um, and these uh, abstractions, we pull out these abstractions from, the, uh, from, from these uh, uh, objects, 
All right? And now we have what looks like our definitions. And this is all still from experience. Your mind is still acting on these ideas, and through reflection, you perceive yourself doing that. And very quickly, you have something like genus and species. You know, very quickly you have, uh, you know, you can even start pulling out maybe even numbers. Right. So we were dealing with numbers before. Uh, we you know, we start when you start trying to abstract away from them. Right, our mind is separating that out. If that is indeed what we can do through abstraction, who knows? You know, well, I'll let you figure that out. So, through these three acts of the mind on our ideas and reflecting on them, we have further knowledge. By putting the ideas together, we have, uh, we have this complex idea of that object. The red, the sweet, the dense, right? That's from that object. I call it apple. I compare that object, other objects, objects, and I find a bunch of them that are similar, really, really similar to it. Those are other apples. And so I, uh, so, you know, that's the second act of the mind. I put those ideas together, find the similarities and the differences, right? And from that second act, you know, comparing them together, right, I find similarity. So by the third act, I abstract away from those and I have my generalization, my general name, apple. Right? And by comparing apples and oranges, I have fruit. From those, I have food and so on and so forth. But again, it's all from experience. My mind is acting on these ideas, sure. But the knowledge of it, that's from reflection. And reflection is an experience. So Locke uh, has tried to provide an account where all ideas come from, they all come from experience. And he, you know, what he thinks he's done is provided a, an account that gets us all the universals we need. And really, it's not that dissimilar from Aristotle in some really important ways, right? Aristotle started with knowledge of uh, the, you know, he started with uh, experiencing the individual substances. Then you get the matter, from the matter you get the form. Now, he still thought the form was in the substance. I mean, the form is uh, knowledge that's distinct from knowledge of the matter. That's why you have categories and then genus and species on the other end. Right? Um, but you always know, still have to start with the objects. You didn't have recollection that Plato talked about. Still, there is some sense in which you recognize, for Aristotle, you recognize the form. Right? You recognize it in the object, whatever that's supposed to mean. But that recognition, you know, when you recognize something, that means that you already have the knowledge of it prior to seeing it. So you recognize a friend in a crowd, but the reason why you recognize a friend is because you already had that knowledge of a friend. Well, if you already have knowledge of the form, uh, before you had knowledge of the matter, well, then some sense in which the idea is innate. Maybe, maybe, maybe. That's a way to understand it. Well, Locke thinks he can uh, get away from this idea with all of our knowledge coming from experience, but uh, the experience that we have with the ideas in our mind is the result of the actions of the mind. But the actions are not the ideas themselves. The ideas come from reflection, our perception of our mind acting on them. So he thinks he's provided this account of knowledge with experience only. So there's no need to include any room for innate ideas. We have our blank slate through experience, through sensation and reflection. We have our ideas, and that's our knowledge. So, you know, Locke's not going to leave it just at that. You know, we've got the epistemology, but he still wants to provide something of an account of the metaphysics. I mean, what's actually really out there. Right? So, uh, we mentioned earlier on that in Locke's metaphysics we have ideas and we have qualities. Ideas all happen up here in the mind, right? Qualities happen out there. Qualities happen in the objects. Now he's not going to go into too heavy a count about matter or things like that. What he simply does talk about are primary qualities and secondary qualities. Now primary qualities are in the object itself in the object itself. Uh, 
The object cannot exist without these qualities. So think about our apple again. Here we have our apple. Now, what you, you know, what we've been pulling out as far as our ideas, we have some ideas from primary qualities and we have some ideas from secondary qualities. Now, notice that with this apple, we could do a lot of things to this apple, right? So cut it in half. Right? Cut the apple in half. Uh, what the apple still has is weight, right? still has number, right? still has uh, a structure to it. Right? I mean, I can cut up the individual slices even more and have more slices of apple, but even those slices still have those primary qualities. Right? They have to do with the body itself, with the object itself, what it weighs, what its structure is, its number. Uh, its measurements, I mean, with the body itself, those are the primary qualities. Yeah. Think very Pythagorean in this way. Right. Pythagoras talked a lot about how number, uh, it, you know, number constitutes everything. Well, <coughs> Locke's not going too far from that. Those are the primary qualities. The secondary qualities are what are not really in the object. So the taste, the smell, right? we talked about, about this before, how uh, the taste, the smell, the color, that's not in that object. That's all in our minds. Well, then the primary qualities are there. Those are really in the object. Those exist whether I perceive the object or not. But the secondary qualities don't exist whether I perceive the object or not. So if I never tasted that apple, there would never be any sweetness to it. And that's the real big distinction for qualities, for, uh, for, for luck. You've got the primary qualities having to deal with the body itself, and then the secondary qualities having to deal with how we, ex how we experience that body. Now, Locke is going to say the primary qualities in some way, shape, or form, somehow, they cause the secondary qualities. Yeah, that's true. Right? Uh, the sweetness of the apple doesn't come from something else. It comes from the primary qualities of the apple. And it's these primary qualities that are uh, going to make the apple, you know, it's going to count for the apple's reality. Uh, the primary qualities are what are in the apple, not in our minds. So there's still some sense of objectivity some sense of knowledge, a truth, independent of what we believe in the apple. So we have this distinction between primary qualities and secondary qualities. And the primary qualities are in the thing, and the secondary qualities are basically in us. So another way of thinking about this might even be, you know, the difference between a uh, description of an element using its atomic structure and the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? or even uh, in, in chemistry, if we describe an element or a substance in terms of it, or, or excuse me, uh, yeah, substance in terms of its chemical composition, you know, that, that's one kind of knowledge, and that's knowledge of its uh, primary qualities, it, you know, its number, its uh, how many of the elements are in there, and the elements are defined or described in terms of um, you know, the, you know, the protons, neutrons, and electrons, and all these other things. So those are the primary qualities. Think very geometric. Right? If you put a number to it, that's a primary quality. Secondary qualities are the sensations. So it wouldn't be so much what you get from physics as you get from, say, culinary school, <laughs> right? Or uh, even aesthetics. Right? Those would be the secondary qualities. Now, the secondary qualities still depend upon the primary qualities but that would be the difference between them. Well, the question remains where these qualities are. So we have these qualities, and they're in the object, but what's there? Now, Locke is going to appeal to Aristotle at this point. He's going to say, yeah, you know, if you want to know, um, you know, if you, you, know, you want to know an object, you describe in terms of primary qualities and secondary qualities. But there's still something in which these qualities have to exist in. And he calls this substance. So I can look at this apple here, 
I have my apple and I can list the primary qualities and I can list the secondary qualities. But these things don't exist just independently. Right? They don't just float around. They have to exist in something. And he calls this substance. Again, borrowing from Aristotle. <clears throat> you might even be able to draw a parallel between form and matter uh, with uh, Locke. You know, the form would be the primary qualities. The matter would be the secondary qualities. Stranger comparisons have been made. <laughs> and both these primary qualities and secondary qualities, they exist in substance. That one. Right? So if I want to know that substance... I describe it in terms of its primary qualities and secondary qualities. Right? Simple. So, we, we have our knowledge of that apple, and it's in that substance. But, what about our knowledge of apple? I'm oh, sorry, our knowledge of substance. What is that? Well, this leads to an interesting problem that, that Locke recognizes. So, we, we have this idea that substance is what primary qualities and secondary qualities exist in. But what does that mean? Well, if we have a clear and distinct idea of something, like I have my apple here, I have my clear and distinct idea of my apple, then I can describe it in terms of its primary qualities and its secondary qualities, which I had earlier, I have my description here. Okay. Now, the problem is, you know, so, so here's, here's, the, here's the idea. If, if I can know something, then I can describe it in terms of primary qualities and secondary qualities. All right. Okay, so what are the primary qualities and secondary qualities of substance in general? Well, there aren't any. Substance in general has no primary qualities. I can give the primary qualities and secondary qualities of that apple, okay, sure. But, you know, I can't give the primary qualities and secondary qualities of anything. I mean, you know, just all things, right? Because there are all kinds of weights and measurements for all things. All things have all varieties of secondary qualities. So if I'm trying to give an account of substance in general, I have to give an account of everything in terms of everything's primary qualities and secondary qualities. Well, I can't do that. It's impossible. So I don't have any clear and distinct idea of substance in general. I can have a clear and idea of that substance, that ample, but in general, no. Can't do it. And this raises an interesting question for Locke, and we see this pop up with Plato and Aristotle before. Everybody's trying to give their account of everything. Everybody's trying to give their account of what really exists. And when it comes to describing what really exists, to give that definition of what really exists, we can't do it. So this leads, you know, this leads to the same problem that Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are doing, and Locke can't escape it either. Right? He recognizes it, to his credit, he recognizes it. But uh, giving an account of, of everything, of what's really real, doesn't look like Locke thinks he can do it. At least he's honest. 